Um, that's a great question. How about we go into White Law? Okay. The, the uh, 116 of Richardson? Because um, the sun's going to set around 5.30. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, if we have open question time out here from 4 to 6, it'll be dark for at least a half an hour of it, if not most of it. <clears throat> okay, so for the sake of the video, uh, there will be open question time Friday from 4 to 6. So, there we go. That way we have all week to finish everything we need to finish for the, for the book. And, uh, and then as many questions as you want on Friday. Okay? Uh, well, today we need to cover the idea of how does sound behave when the object that's emitting the sound is moving. It also works when the object that's listening to the sound is moving. Okay? So there's two cases, two situations. One situation is, if the object that's emitting the sound is moving slower than the sound itself, you get one scenario. And then the other scenario is, if the object that's emitting the sound is moving faster than the sound itself. Okay? So, um, let's do the faster than situation, because that one's a little bit easier. Okay, now, first of all, what objects do we have in common practice that are going to move faster than the speed of sound? What's that? Yeah, just that's about it. Fighter jets. We don't really have anything. I mean, even jet airliners go 0.8 Mach. Wait, wait. There's some terminology for you. You need to know that. What is that? Mach 0.8. What does that mean? Yeah, if, it, if the object traveled at Mach 1, it would be traveling at the speed of sound. So it's just a percentage of the speed of sound. So Mach 0.8 would be 80% of the speed of sound. Does that kind of make sense to everybody? So um, just as a, as a reference, most of you have flown on jet airliners before. They travel around Mach 0.8. Okay? Is that, you all right with all that? So they don't break the sound barrier. Now, they used to have one that, what, that did this. It's called the Concorde. Uh, French airline, what was it? Air France? I don't anyway, French airline flew. It was a Concorde. It was a supersonic jet transport plane. It was really cool. Uh, fascinating airplane. Beautiful aircraft. It, was, it had all kinds of engineering challenges. Uh, and they used it for a long time, but it was just in the end too expensive, so they quit do doing it, and it's not there anymore. Um, yeah, so if you want to go faster than the speed of sound, be a fighter pilot. Uh, <clears throat> Who was the first person to break the sound barrier? I forgot his name too. <laughs> I hate it when that happens. It'll hit me in a few minutes. He was a test, famous test, Chuck Yeager. There you go. He, Chuck Yeager was the first guy to do it. Uh, okay, anyway, here's what happens. Say you're flying, uh, Chuck, you're Chuck Yeager and you're flying the Bell X-1, which is the first airplane to break the speed of sound, and uh, it's emitting noise. Where's the noise coming from? It's a jet. <laughs> it's coming from its engine. Okay, its engine is very noisy. And so, uh, I can't draw it. It looked kind of like a funny looking rocket. Okay, that's an airplane. I know it may not look like one, just pretend. Okay, this is an airplane. It has a short little stubby wing. Okay, and the, the engine itself is making a lot of noise. Now, what does that noise do? How does it leave the engine? What does it look like leaving? It's a, it's a bubble, and that bubble is moving out. Does that make sense? How fast is it moving out? What's that? Fast. Fast. How fast? 
Mach 1, it's, it's the speed of sound. It's traveling at the it's sound. It's traveling at the speed of sound. Does that make sense? Okay, so it's leaving the jet engine at Mach 1. Uh, how fast is that? I gave you the equation for that yesterday. Do y'all remember the equation? Three thirty one oops three thirty one times the square root of T over two seventy three. So the speed of sound is roughly three thirty one, three thirty four, depending on how warm it is, okay? Around here. It's pretty chilly this morning, it's probably pretty close to three thirty one. <laughs> okay, three thirty one what? What are the units on this? Y'all are really quiet today. Yeah, this is just meters per second. Good old fashioned meters per second. Okay, so the sound is leaving the engine at that speed. But he's got his fighter jet and he's traveling faster than the sound. Does that make sense to everybody? So there's this bubble leaving the engine and it's traveling out. So say one second, now I'm gonna leave the airplane here for a second and that sound bubble one second later is out here. Okay, it's a big sound bubble. Where's the airplane at that point? Past the bubble. Does that make sense to everybody? He's not in the bubble anymore. He is now out here. Now I gotta redraw my airplane. Wow, it gets worse every time. Okay, there we go. There's the airplane. And uh, he's now out here. Okay, so now he's going to make a new bubble, and, how, and that one's just going to get started. So, uh, <clears throat> half a second, or one, let's do one second later. One second later, that, the bubble from here is this big. Okay, but that first bubble is now bigger. And now the jet airplane's over here. Boy, I wish I was a better artist. Okay, let's see. So here's the point. If I was a good artist, this would form a line. You see there's a, a line there on the edge of all these bubbles. How many of y'all have been in a motorboat? You know, on the lake? Okay, what is the wake, what shape does it form? The wake on the set. Uh, okay, so yeah, if you're in the boat looking at the wake, it's just like this wave of water. But if you were a bird sitting, flying over the lake, looking down, what would the shape of the wake look like? It would be a big V with the boat right at the corner. Okay? That's what this is. The reason it forms that shape is because the boat travels faster than the water waves. Any time an object travels faster than the waves it makes, it forms this V shape. On a boat, we call it the wake. On a jet airplane, we call it the sound barrier. Okay, so does this kind of make sense? How are y'all doing with this idea? Does it, do you understand the idea of the V shape? Here's what this means. Over here, even though you can be standing on the ground, looking up, and you say, hey, there's an airplane above me. What do you hear? Nothing. Because the sound hasn't gotten to you yet. All the sound is behind this V here. So by the time the airplane's over here somewhere, oh, my airplane gets worse every time. Okay, by the time the airplane's over here somewhere, then the sound barrier is gonna hit you. So the airplane's way over there, out of sight, heading away from you, and then the sound goes bam, and it hits you. You go, whoa, that was loud. Okay, are y'all following how this works? Does this kind of make sense? Okay, so uh, I grew up in Nebraska. I think I've told you that before. It's not far from uh, off at Air, Fort, Air Force Base, which is where <clears throat> the, the US Air Force has seven airplanes all of which are capable of controlling the entire nuclear arsenal of the United States. All of it. 
from any one of those airplanes. And so their job is to perpetually keep one in the air all the time. So there's never less than one of those airplanes in the air at any point in time. Why would they do such a thing? Yeah, in case somebody knocks out our normal controls, they can't knock out that airplane, and that airplane can control all our nuclear arsenal so we can still fight the war from the air. I'm just telling you, this is what's going on, okay? So they've got this plane flying around. One of them is always in the air at any point in time. They call them the looking glass, and I don't know why they do that, but that's what it's called. And so meanwhile, they don't want bad guys shooting those things down. So they've perpetually got other airplanes patrolling the area. And so I grew up with F-4 Phantoms flying overhead, and these are fighter jets, and they, they'll, they'll zoom by, and I remember standing there as a kid watching them go, not hearing a thing. And then when it's way down there and I can barely see it anymore, bam, the sound hits you. And it's because they were flying past the speed of sound. And, and there you go, that's, that's, I'm just telling you this is the way it is, okay? Here's the equations for this. <clears throat> okay, so the sine of theta is equal to the speed of sound over the speed of the source, where theta is that angle right there. It's a pretty straightforward equation, actually. The, the, math, the, the picture of what's happening is kind of complex, but the equation is very simple. Okay, so let's do a quick problem. Let's say uh, the temperature is... Um, <coughs> Fifteen degrees Celsius, and uh, <clears throat> the airplane is flying at an altitude of one kilometer. It's pretty low, and uh, the speed of the airplane is Mach. <coughs> Let's see. How about Mach? 1.6. It's kind of slow. I was feeling lazy that day. And uh, my question is, how far away from you, horizontally, is the airplane when you hear the sound? Okay, do you all understand the question? Does that make sense to everybody? How far away, horizontally, is the airplane from you? when you hear the sound. Okay, so how are we going to start this problem? I don't need to draw the picture because it's already drawn. We already have our equations on the board. What do we do? <laughs> Let's start with the speed of sound. I think that's a good, a good step place. Let's, what is the speed of sound this day? Well, we got the temperature here. Do I just plug in 15 right there? No. What do I need to plug in here? Yeah, I need Kelvin here. So this is going to be 15 plus 273. Okay, so... <clears throat> the speed of sound is going to be 331 times the square root of 15 plus 273 divided by 273. What's the speed of sound that day? Okay, 340 meters per second. So that's the speed of sound that day. Okay, now, <clears throat> this airplane is traveling at Mach 1.6. How fast is the airplane traveling? 
1.6 times 340. Does that make sense to everybody? Remember, Mach is like, it's like the ratio of the speed of the aircraft to the speed of sound. It's a percentage of the speed of sound. So if it's 160% of the speed of sound, you just do 1.6 times the speed of sound. Okay, so what is the speed of the airplane? <clears throat> Hold on, I gotta clear some board space here. Ah, this is horrible. Okay, so the speed of the plane is what now? Uh, 543. 543.95. 5. Okay, what can we do with that? Now that we know the speed of sound and the speed of the plane, what can we do? We can find theta. We can find theta, exactly. And that's going to be this angle here. Okay, so. Uh, What's theta? How do you, how are we going to get to theta? Do we divide by sine? Arc sine. Yeah, we got to do arc sine. You got to undo the sine by using arc sine or inverse sine, whichever language you want to use there. <coughs> okay, so y'all find theta. Thirty-eight point who? Oh, make sure your calculator's in degrees. Okay. Say it one more time. Okay, so now that we know this triangle angle, how's that going to help us? Seems like we're going to need to draw a triangle somewhere, right? Yeah. yeah. So the triangle might be, here's the ground, here's the altitude, and there's the sound wave. Oh, here's altitude here. Here's delta x here. Where's theta in our triangle? Yeah, how'd you get that? How'd you know that? Opposite, Op opposite interior angles? Y'all yeah. remember that? So there's theta right down here. Okay, so now that you know the altitude and the theta, you can find delta x. Oh, uh, you just never get done with Sokotoa. You thought you could be done with it, but no. Here we are in the last chapter and it's still coming back to get you. Okay, so what's delta x? <clears throat> Let's see, looks like we're gonna have to use tangent to get there. Tangent of theta is opposite over adjacent. Your altitude is one kilometer. Opposite is one kilometer. I'll let y'all work out the tangent on your paper.
There we go. Okay, y'all following all this? Does this kind of make sense? So this is how sound behaves if the source is what? Faster or slower? Moving faster. Faster than the sound itself. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? Now let's move to the other case. What happens if the source is moving slower than the speed of sound? Do you understand that question? Okay, so I'm going to have to draw that same picture again. And rather than spending half an hour trying to erase that board, I'll just flip it over. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> What, what kind of objects are we talking about now that move slower than the speed of sound? Anything else. Oh yeah, just about anything else, right? We could be talking about a car, a bird, a person, a snail. Uh, you know, all those snails don't really emit much sound. I've never, I've never heard a snail make any noise. Rabbits make noise though. Have you ever heard a rabbit make noise? Just try to catch you a wild one. I caught one one day. I was, I was about, I don't know, 13, and I, there was a little baby one running around the backyard, and I caught it. I don't know how I meant I caught this little rabbit, and that thing squealed. It was loud, and then it bit my finger, and I, ah, and I let it go, so, you know. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know. Is that faster or slower than the speed of sound? Rabbits. Slower. Much slower. Okay. So here's what's going to happen. Uh, let's talk about a car. That's, that's a nice easy one. A car, I can draw cars. So we're going to use a car and it, the, the, the driver of the car is blowing the horn. So the, hor the, the, the source of the sound is the horn. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? So uh, here's your car and it's blowing the horn and it's moving slower than the speed of sound. Okay, one second later that sound bubble has left the car and the sound bubble is now out there, okay? Where's the car one second later? Further down the road, but where? Relative to the bubble. Inside the bubble. Does that make sense to everybody? Because it's moving slower than the speed of sound and the bubble is the speed of sound. It's the, okay, so one second later, the car is now here inside the bubble. And it emits a new bubble. Does that make sense to everybody? So <clears throat> one second later, this sound bubble that was here is now out here. If I was a good artist, that would be a concentric bubble. <sighs> this one doesn't work either. And the new bubble And the new bubble is going to be So let me erase that first bubble. So here's my point, if I was a good artist, these two here will be much closer than these two here. Why are they closer here than there? Any ideas? Yeah, the car's moving that way. Does that make sense to everybody? As the car moves that way, the sound bubbles are going to be smashed closer together on the front end and spread further apart on the back end. Okay, does that, y'all kind of buy that idea? Does that make sense to everybody? I'm sorry for the horrible artistry. I can do better than artistry though, because you've heard this. You know exactly what this sounds like. You've been standing on the edge of the road when somebody drives by with their horn blowing and it sounds like this. You've heard that before, right? Why does it sound like high pitch, and then it passes you, why did it change? I'm sorry, that's horrible artistry as well. 
Why did it change? What's that? Yeah, when it was, as it was passing you, it switched from sound bubbles close together, and then once it passed you, it's sound bubbles far apart. Let me change the language of that. Frequency. The rate at which the sound bubbles were hitting your ear as the car was approaching you was much quicker than the rate at which the sound bubbles were hitting your ear after the car passed you. And your ear hears frequency in terms of pitch. High frequency! Low frequency. Right? So as the car was approaching you, it was a high frequency. But as the car left you, it was a low frequency. And so you hear it. Okay, I know y'all, it's like early in the morning and it's kind of chilly. Have y'all experienced this before? Do y'all know what I'm talking about? Okay, there's a name for that phenomenon. It's called the Doppler effect. And <clears throat> The Doppler effect, <clears throat> you've probably heard the term before, but not in terms of fire trucks driving past you. You've heard the term in terms of the weather, right? Doppler radar, that's what that is. See, because it also works not only for the source of the sound, but also for the hearing of the sound. So. At the weather station, they've got a radar antenna that sends out a sound. And it hits a cloud that's moving, and it reflects off the cloud. So it does two things. First of all, the sound hits the cloud and comes back to the, radio, to the radar station, and they can measure that time and calculate how far away the cloud is. But then it sends the next one, and it can then calculate how much the cloud has moved. So now you get not only distance, but speed. And so you can, because of the change in frequency, you can get the speed of the cloud. Okay? So here's the equation for this one. This one's a little messier. frequency observed is equal to the frequency of the source <clears throat> times the speed of sound plus the speed of the observer divided by the speed of sound minus the speed of the source. This is the Doppler equation. And uh, notice, the frequency that you hear is not the same as the frequency of the source. So when that car drove by you and it sounded like neither one of those sounds was the sound of the horn. One was a little bit higher than the horn, and the other one was a little bit lower than the horn, but neither one was the sound of the horn itself. If the car was sitting in the parking lot just par blowing its horn at you, it would have sounded exactly in between those two. Okay. <clears throat> Notice the speed of the observer and the source is either positive or negative depending on whether it's going towards or away from the other object. So no, no, the sound is just a, it's just a positive value, but the observer or the source could be moving towards each other or away from each other or one towards and one away. It could, there's any different, there's four different combinations there. And so these, these two numbers could be positive or negative depending on whether it's going towards or away from the other object. Does that make sense? Okay. So the equation is plus this, but this could be negative. And this equation is minus this, but this could be negative. Okay, y'all doing all right? Okay, so let's try a problem. <clears throat> a 
you're uh, riding your bicycle and a fire truck pulls out and the fire truck is heading towards you but coming up behind you. So you're riding away from the fire truck. You're riding away from the fire truck, but the fire truck's coming at you. Does that make sense? Okay. And <clears throat> the frequency of the siren uh, is 300 hertz. Uh, let's make it more. 500. 300 is right on the edge of hearing, so we'll, we'll make it a, a more audible sound. And, and you're traveling... It, you're traveling at uh, 20... Oh, let's make that slower. 10 meters per second. But the fire truck is traveling at... 30 meters per second. Okay, now, where, where are you and where's the truck again? There you go. You're going this way. The fire truck's coming at you. Okay, does everybody see that? that make, I'll, I'll. <clears throat> okay, the question is, what's the frequency that you hear? Okay, so how are we going to do this one? Where do we start? Yeah, let's use the Doppler effect. Okay, so what do I plug in here for the speed of the source? Uh, 500. The 500, that's the source, that's the, the frequency that the siren is emitting. And, and how do we hear that? How do, what does frequency correspond to in, the, in terminology that we're familiar with? Pitch. Yeah, the frequency is the pitch. So 500 is, is pretty high. I mean, it's not like, I mean, it's, it's a fire engine siren. Y'all have heard these before, right? Okay, so, uh, so we're gonna plug in 500 right here. Oh, we need a temperature. What do we need temperature for? Yeah, we need that for the speed of sound. So the temperature on this day is, uh, We'll stick with the one we used last time, 15 degrees Celsius. Okay, since we know the temperature is 15, what's the speed of sound? We did this in the last problem. What was it? Okay, so now we're gonna put 340 here and 340 there. Okay, now what are we going to put in for the, for the speed of the observer? What's that? Yeah, we're going to put you. You're riding a bike. Now, wait, wait. Positive or negative? Why negative? Yeah, you're riding your bike this way and the truck is going this way. You're going away from the truck. Now you might not actually succeed in getting away because the truck's going faster, but nonetheless you're trying to go away from the truck. Does that make sense to everybody? So you're gonna plug in here a negative 10 because you're going away from the truck. You all right with that? Okay, what about the last thing here? What do we plug in there? Thirty, positive or negative? Positive. Why? Yeah, it's going towards you, so that gets a positive thirty. So this is going to be minus a positive thirty, and this is going to be plus a negative ten. Y'all see that? Does that make sense to everybody? <clears throat> so this will be plus a negative ten. This will be po minus a positive thirty. Okay, so when you punch all this out. What do you get? <clears throat> 
What's the frequency that you hear? So it was emitted at 500, but you hear 532. How does that sound different? What's going to sound different about that? It's going to be a higher pitch. A higher frequency means a higher pitch. Okay? <clears throat> now, after that fire engine passes you, what's it going to sound like? How are you going to tell? Okay, it's going to, the, the frequency is going to get lower, right? Because it's going away from you now. What are you going to change in this equation? The signs. What's going to happen? I'll, I'll use a different color here. What's going to happen to the speed of the, of the observer after the fire truck passes you? This one will be positive. Why? Yeah. Now you start. The bike was here and the truck was here, but as the truck passes you, now the bike is going towards the truck, and the truck is going away from the bike. Does that make sense? So this will become positive 10, and this will become negative 30. Okay, so the speed of the observer, what's the speed of the observer going to be after the truck passes? So just change that sign up there and this sign down here. So this will be plus a positive and this will be minus a negative. <coughs> Say it again. How's that going to sound compared to the original siren? Lower. Okay, does this kind of make sense to everybody how this works? Okay. <clears throat> uh, we're just going to talk about one more idea here that's related to all this. We talked about it a little bit with the, radio, with the weather station, but it works with other things too. For instance, bats. I'm not talking about baseball bats. I'm talking about the little flying mice creatures. They're not mice at all, but I know, just pretend with me. But they look like flying mice, but they're not. Anyway, it's a bat. How do they, you've heard the expression, blind as a bat? Their eyes aren't all that good. How do they see where they're going? Y'all know this stuff, right? Yeah, echolocation. Let me put a different word on there. Doppler effect. Okay, so you're a bat flying through the sky, and you'd like to eat dinner. Okay, what do they do? They emit sound. Where does that sound go? It goes in a spherical bubble away from the bat. Okay? That spherical bubble will hit a bug somewhere. What's going to happen there? It's going to bounce back. Okay, so now let me just say this to you. So the bat is moving. It's flying, right? So it's got a Doppler effect because it's moving. But the bug, is it just sitting still? It's flying also. So the bug is moving, the bat is moving, and there's a Doppler effect that the, for the sound that the bug hears. Do y'all catch that? The sound that the bug hears. But then what happens? What happens to this original sound bubble that hit the bug? Y'all know. What happens to the sound bubble that hits the bug? It bounces back. So now, what I'm trying to, I'm, I'm telling you this for a reason, it's on your homework, okay? There's, you have to fi first figure out what's the frequency observed by the bug. Not that the bug cares or notices. But the bug is going to hear a frequency described by the Doppler effect. And then it's going to bounce off the bug and the sound that the bug heard will now become the source as it leaves the bug and comes back to the bat and so you have a second Doppler effect problem for what the bat hears. It's a double Doppler effect problem. One for what the bug hears and then one for what the bat hears leaving the bug. Does this make sense to everybody? It's two Doppler effect problems in one. Okay, well, when you get to the homework, I'll let you wrestle with that. It's a fun one. Two, two Doppler effect problems back to back. Okay? 
So uh, with that said, uh, we're done and the lawn mowers are telling us it's time to be done anyway, so. But they're moving, so there's a Doppler effect problem right there. Okay, y'all have a good day and I'll see you Friday. Unless you're in lab before then. Uh, one other note, I'm sorry. The material covered in the lab, we're only gonna hit it lightly in class because you're hitting it heavy in the lab. Okay, so it's not that it's less important, it's just that we're not gonna hit it as heavy in class because you're hitting it heavy in lab, okay? Now I'm really done.